Welcome to Health Day Chats. Today, we're speaking with Barry Yuan. Barry is a physiotherapist for over 17 years, and he's also a software engineer. He's had experience in health tech and digital health ventures, and he's the co-founder of Health Aid. Barry, thank you for jumping on the interview. Can you describe in your words how you've come about starting Health Aid and what are you aiming to achieve with this company? Well, thanks for having me. Um, it's a great question. So basically how, how we came up with the idea, uh, myself and uh, Dr. Karamata, who is a GP I used to work with clinically in Melbourne, is that um, we often found that lots of clinicians were Googling and looking on YouTube and different sources, different information to, to uh, send to their patients from exercises to health advice to in many forms of type of self-diagnosis um, topics. Um, the issue with that was we found that there was quite a bit of also misinformation and opinion pieces um, online where patients don't have the research or uh, clinical expertise or skills to distill or synthesize and understand that type of information. And often you'd find the more engaging, the less evidence base often it was at least five, 10 years ago. Um, that's starting to change now with more influences that are actual verified doctors. Um, but previously it created a lot of um, potential misinformation. Um, patients coming in challenging doctors and physios and people like that. Why did you say that? I thought I had a disc injury. I thought my disc slipped out um, when it wasn't exactly the case um, for a complex range of reasons. Um, as a result of that, we, we decided that there was an opportunity to at least focus on the preventive health space because it was the area where um, health professionals are most interested in but have the least training in, in general, because they're emerging areas. It could be a frequently asked question that they get every day. They might be repeating the same script five, 10 times a day, particularly um, you might understand it, Will, where you're explaining the same concept again and again. So there'll be a better way of doing that, particularly. <laughs> you should be focused on higher value care. So we, we decided to build a, a, a video content platform. And we also tried to serve the health professionals too. Um, with more recently burnout from the COVID situation and things like that to add another potential stream of income. In this way, they can scale their expertise and knowledge not to their local, not just to their local communities, but to the world, as well as being able to provide free information to assist marketing their clinics and services. On top of that, um, they can potentially make money from um, producing digital programs and courses, which they can potentially sell to, to the world or share to different people which may benefit that doesn't require like hands-on assessment or treatment. I agree with a few points there you raised with number one, there is, I think, a lot of misinformation on the internet. And as a patient or as someone that's not from a health professional background, it's really confusing for you. You don't know what's right. You don't know what's wrong. Um, and then, yeah, it does create a lot of confusion when you then go trying to self-diagnose or trying to just even help yourself out. So there's a lot of things that actually we can share widely with the public that you, like you say, we repeat or we say um, in a similar fashion on a daily basis, you know, general information that can actually apply and help a lot of people out. And a lot of times people don't know this kind of information. So yeah, for, for us, to, for us as health professional, having a platform to share that information, it helps the patients, it helps us. And I think you alluded to as, as health aid, as we're a company of sharing knowledge to improve people's I guess, health and health literacy. Can you tell me from your experience as a physiotherapist, so what are the most common but yet preventable issues that people come to see you about? That's a great question. So it often just revolves around, revolves around basic government guidelines around being healthy. So uh, this is around nutrition, around significant, uh, enough sleep and enough exercise. Um, and often if you manage those three pillars, uh, on top of that, I'd say stress as well, which is all related 
um, you often prevent a lot of these um, conditions that are presented to, you know, the doctor's or physio's office. Um, on top of that, I think there's an increasing educational component around emerging research around how to do things to reduce the risk or eliminate the risk of injury, um, particularly around loading, how much you should be training, what the cross-training type of regime should look like, who you should see for when, how and why. Um, but basically, I think more and more in this busy, increasing complex life where a lot of people are on their phones and less active, um, the, the lifestyle factors associated with reducing the risk of these potential chronic diseases and you know, musculoskeletal issues can be significantly reduced. On top of that, there's more and more interest in health span, which is around the quality of your life, you know, in the same period of age, uh, as well as longevity. Longevity is just an extension of the age. Um, but I'd rather more focus on health span because that's the quality of life of the person. And you, you find that people are living longer and longer now. So you're finding that older people are more active, like playing tennis and running marathons and things, uh, which is requiring extra or you know uh, unique expertise to to keep them on the field or on the track um, to maintain physical activities levels as well as their health, which is a great thing. Yeah, I think it's an interesting combination that now we are um, more sedentary <clears throat> than before, but we're also living longer. So there's almost more time for us to experience. Um, musculoskeletal disorders from our perspective. And there's an interesting um, post I read from a friend of mine that he said that with uh, a common thing that we see as physios in the clinic is of course, lower back pain, or <clears throat> often it's non-traumatic lower back pain. He was saying that we should kind of be reframing it as a, as a symptom of, uh, I guess, a poor lifestyle rather than a, a condition on its own. So in order to address that, just like you would address, you know, type two diabetes with exercise, with diet, with changing a range of things within a person's lifestyle to really manage that condition, we should be, you know, uh, approaching like a non-traumatic lower back pain in a similar fashion that we should be addressing the lifestyle factors. We should be identifying the lifestyle factors that are contributing to this symptom. And then we should take steps to uh, address that in order to really have that long-term progress. So Absolutely. So um, I often see in my 17 years of practice um, what the, the triggers are for, from people who present with back pain. And it's often, interestingly, not physical, like literally. It's often they've had a trigger or stress moment in their life that can be traced back. Um, like someone um, maybe passed away in their family or or they're getting increased stress at work more so than a specific physical like lifting injury, which, which does happen too. But um, it, it basically highlights that, for example, back pain is a multifactorial problem where you need to look at a system of factors that's beyond literally the physical, uh, you know, what we call as physios as, you know, mechanism of injury. Mm -hmm. and, and as um, I think as a patient, it's really helpful for them to really understand that, you know, for them to know that, hey, actually, it's not just my lifting that's contributing to my back pain. Actually, there's so many more things. And these things are often more manageable than the things that we tend to treat. And that's really good news for the patient because it gives them more power to then be able to have, take control of the body, take control of the symptoms, and then to prevent it or to address it when it happens. Um, so I guess... You know, what, what can you identify anything else? We generally speaking, for example, for back pain, you know, how can people really prevent these issues or at least reduce the likelihood of experiencing back pain? You know, can you give a good summary of that. Yep. So I think, um, at least in 2022, um, there's a work from home initiative, right? <laughs> from COVID, uh, to prevent infection, etc. Um, often I find that people's workspaces aren't set up properly at home. Um, so there, there's a lot of education component there or that they might be exercising, but they're not exercising um, with the right timing. So, so what I mean by that is they might exercise at the start of the day and then sit like as a coder, for example, for eight hours straight and then go to the gym afterwards. 
that's not necessarily the best for their health because um, sitting all day in, in the same position can increase the risk of back problems. On, on top of that, they should be mindful of maybe breaking it up into smaller components um, where they're moving every every so often, like about half an hour or so to make sure that they're getting blood flow going and making sure their soft tissues and body is mobile. And, and that's kind of a hard um, habit to, to create, you know, to, to address because often, for example, these knowledge type of jobs require you to focus and do deep work at your computer for more than one hour. But somehow that needs to change because I do, yeah, get, get a lot more of, work from home type of injuries um, at, at the clinic as a result of not necessarily the amount of physical activity they do, you know, in, in general, because they, they look fit, they look, they, they enjoy the gym, they, they might take up some kind of uh, weekend warrior type of sport, but um, they need to readdress um, their routines during the day. One, one thing that I guess uh, in align with what you said that I tend to like to tell to my patients is, a, the term of movement nutri- movements nutrition so just like you should have a you know you should get a variety of dietary nutrition nutrition for good health you should get a variety of movement nutrition for your good musculoskeletal or just general health as well so for example if you are sitting typically for work eight hours a day you you might then go to the gym and you'll be either sitting doing exercises on the bench or you're lying down on the bench doing exercise and it's usually in that sort of um in that frontal plane yeah so that's great you know you're probably hitting your uh, physical activity uh government guideline requirement but in terms of the variety of movement you're doing for your body you're not getting a lot so i think just having some kind of routine it doesn't matter what it is i think you gotta work it out yourself that can you add more variety in your movements during the day whether that's literally like you said break it up break up the position in which you're sitting change up the way you're sitting for you know as frequently as you can without disrupting your work or you really make an emphasis after work, before work, to then just really add in this movement variety into your routine, right? Rather than just be sitting, standing, sitting, standing. That's it. Yeah. Yep. So uh, another thing to that is that, like a standing desk, which is often not that practical too. Um, you can you can potentially add a standing treadmill underneath, <laughs> you know, <laughs> keyboard if you want to do that. Um, but often my, my question is how how like you you get feedback from that and you can, there's a lot of consumer available wearable devices that are in the market that can help you track this. Like, like my aura ring, for example, mm-hmm. which tracks my sleep, my activity levels. And it also has an AI recommender system, which tells me, say, Hey Barry, uh, you haven't got up for, you know, like an hour or two, please get moving. So there's a lot of things that can help track and, um, you know, change or help change your behaviour, which have proven to to work as well. Um, so I guess for that point, it's setting up an environment where you can actually get feedback to remind you in the moment could help. And, and there's a lot of digital health type of related technologies that can assist that, that as I said, available in the market for all public. Yeah, I think these wearables and these trackers are, super useful because often we're dealing with um, trying to get healthier. It's oftentimes behavior change and that's really difficult to do. So getting help, getting feedback uh, throughout your process of behavior change can be more effective than not. Right. I guess um, I want to ask you, Barry, is uh, apart from, I guess, musculoskeletal, apart from it being painful or affecting the many things you need to do in life, <clears throat> why should someone take the steps to prevent musculoskeletal injuries. Okay. So there's a couple of factors to that. Number one is I think the big one that I often see is uh, to prevent chronic pain. So just ongoing pain that no longer is, you know, a, a more acute response to tissue injury, but it becomes a psychosocial 
was, you know, that affects other parts of the body, um, you know, the psychology, for example. So I think it's important that you sort of address that, if, uh, you know, by preventing muscular injury before it becomes to that stage. Secondly, I think the musculoskeletal system is the most injured or one of the top one or two or three in, in the world when it comes to cost to the system. Um, and thirdly, I think without the musculoskeletal system, um, one of the, you can't exercise, right? And exercise has again and again and again proven to be literally, if it was a pill, it would be <laughs> the best pill you could have in the, in the world that treats and prevents a lot, you know, one of the largest ranges of medical conditions beyond just physical, like the metabolic ones like diabetes, type 2, heart disease, and even mental health as well. So, so you're saying like um, if you're living a lifestyle routine that's conducive to musculoskeletal injuries, then you're also li living a lifestyle that's conducive to so many other chronic diseases that are preventable, right? If you then took the steps Correct. to change a little bit of things about your lifestyle. So what I also want to ask you, Barry, is fast forward, say, say 10 years. Okay. We're in 2032. Hopefully COVID isn't too bad. All right. You, a person walks into a physio clinic. What do you think is different or, or what do you think needs to be different? Okay. I think as physios, um, I'm, I'm going to speak from a physio perspective. Um, we, our DNA is hands-on, right? We want to touch the patient possibly that's a sort of reason why we, we entered the profession. I think what should be done is that there should be more things that remotely monitor the patient to give us more feedback in between the consults because we often get 20, half an hour or an hour with the patient. Um, and, and as you know, like, I mean, we're assessing and treating, or we need to impact their complete lifestyle. So um, I hope that there'll be more data that we get on the initial consult and follow-up consults on what they're actually doing at home, the quality of the exercises, you know, uh, the behaviour of their symptoms, because often you wouldn't need, you wouldn't expect it, but patients come in in stressful states. So the information they might provide you is not sometimes that accurate in many ways, or that they don't know how to describe it in physio terms or whatever terms to assist us in, um, making clinical decisions for them that's most appropriate. So I would say things that, you know, add data to the physio to help make better decisions remotely is probably the biggest thing that's emerging. And I think that will improve over time. Yeah. And I think not only does that help us as a clinician, it also really helps the patients to monitor their progress and then for them to look back on their progress saying, hey, actually, I've gone better. I haven't. I've um, gone worse. So then it gives them really a sense of um, power and knowledge over how they're going and what the condition is like. So it really helps both parties, I reckon. Yeah. And I think, yeah, our role as physios would probably more transition to be more of a coach or facilitator than that type of doctor, patient, health professional, patient, I'm listening to you one way relationship. Um, so we'll be more a partner to them. Uh, to help them achieve the goals that they want to um, discuss yeah. with you and think you can help with. Yeah. 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 Definitely heard that term as well. Us, us being more uh, like, like a health coach, right? Cause the patient comes in with, with a, with a complaint, but often it translates to a goal that they're not able to achieve, whether that's physical or, or some other kind of goal. And it's up to us to really get them to that goal with our expertise and with triaging different health professional as needed. So yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think really excited to see what's going to come with the, the future of a profession as well. Well, Barry, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I think this is a good place to leave on. Um, and we at Health Aid will be continue having these interviews with different health professionals. So stay tuned. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.